Well, I want to invite you to turn with me to Titus 2, verses 11 through 14 is where we're going to be studying this morning. And we are going to be looking at the great topic of the grace of God and how it works in your life and in our lives. And um, it's arguably one of the most important topics and concepts for you to understand in the Christian life. How does the grace of God impact our lives? And what I find is that often we think of the grace of God and we think of it as it relates simply to salvation, but not necessarily on the day-to-day grace of God working in our lives. We think of it as justification realm in our lives, but what about sanctification realm and concept and it's doing and working in our lives? How does grace change our lives? And, um, and really, that's where Paul is going to go in this, in this text because he's going to get beyond. And, and grace of God is, is primary, is critical in understanding salvation. But he's talking to <clears throat> Christian believers. He's going to emphasize the importance of grace. And uh, he's actually going to tie it to the previous verses in verses 1 through 10 as he's going to use a transitional word for in verse 11 building on the theological foundation, verses 1 through 10, where he dealt with five different demographics of people and how they were to to adorn the gospel of God, as we see in verse 10. Adorn the doctrine of of God and and live that out. Their lives ought to emanate that. Live that out in their lives. And we saw the different demographics of older men and and older women, younger women and younger men, and then servants in, in that context as well. And he's going to talk about if you're going to adorn the doctrine of God, if you're going to live this out in your lives, he says, grace is the key to doing that. Grace is absolutely necessary in our lives. So let's begin by defining it. Now, probably a simple definition of grace that we are probably all familiar with is unmerited favor. Undeserved favor. I've also heard it said like this, grace is everything... For nothing to those who don't deserve anything. It's everything for nothing to those who don't deserve anything. And so God's grace is a critical part of Paul's teaching. It permeated his, his epistles. You read through his epistles and you find grace is a buzzword and, and not just a, a word, but a concept that he drives us back to over and over again. One scholar writes Paul could not think of Christian truth and conduct apart from God's grace. Donald Guthrie, in in his commentary on the pastoral epistles, he writes, the expression, the grace of God, may fairly be said to be the key word of Paul's theology. He cannot think of Christian salvation apart from the grace of God. But what we find is that Paul also cannot think of Christian living apart from the grace of God. It's a critical part of that. Now, when people think about grace in today's society, there are two, um, I'm trying to think of how to say this, there are two, two ways that it is sometimes polluted or misappropriated um, that we need to understand the kind of the two swing sides of grace today. The first way that sometimes grace is polluted is on the aspect or the realm, or it's polluted in our thinking in the realm of legalism today. We live, in a, we live in a world that is a, a merit-based system uh, from, from all the way from growing up. In grade school and in schools, if you do well and you work hard and you get good grades and, and you proceed. Uh, if you play sports, if you do well and you work hard, you'll get a starting position and, and you'll, do, you'll, you know, you'll get applause and praise of men, similarly in instruments and, and different uh, uh, ways of, of doing that. It moves on to college then. The same merit system continues, and if you do well, you, uh, you, you're rewarded for your excellence, and, and you are excelled there. And it moves into the business world. In business, if, if you work hard, and you produce, and, and, and you are profitable to the business, you're exalted and elevated in your business industry, and, and we live in that merit-type system. But if you don't do well in your business, if you're sloppy in your business, you'll get fired, and they'll let you go. Merit is a part of our system, and it moves right into, really today, in our country, in our world, in the spiritual realm. 
All the world's religions, except for biblical Christianity, are based on a merit-type system. You go and ask anybody on the street how they, uh, why do they think that they would go to heaven, and a majority of the time you'll hear something to the aspect of, well, I'm a pretty good person, and I do this, or I'm a part of this church, and it's a merit-based, I can earn something, I can do something to merit God's favor. And even major branches of Christianity that even uh, uh, hold to those type of systems. But Paul really blasts this uh, in different places and epistles, even specifically in Romans 3 when he said, By the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for the law is the knowledge of sin. So that he says it's not a merit-based system at all that Christianity is based upon. You can by no means earn that. So that's one swing side that we have a concept in our mind when we think about grace. We still tend to sometimes tie into it merits or works or doing something to add to it. And we've polluted grace with those type of theologies and thinkings. The other swing of uh, of grace, so we have the legalism side. The other side of that, and I'm going to give you a $50 word here, is antinomianism. You're saying, man, why, why a $50 word? Can you break that down in little small chunks of change? Well, if you think about the word anti against namas, law, antinomianism, lawlessness. You say, why didn't you just say lawlessness? Well, I thought I would teach you a new word this morning. Antinomianism is the other swing side where it's kind of like, man, don't, don't bind me up with legalistic rules and things. I just want to live under grace today and I can live how I want to live. I can do what I want to do. And so God's standards for living really don't apply to me because, man, I've just been poured under grace. And so, so there's a mantra that kind of goes along with that. And, and I feel like I should almost say it in like a 60s hippie uh, you know, tone, kind of like, hey man, I I'm not into your rules kind of religion. Uh, I'm into grace and grace living. And, um, and so there's kind of that side mantra of, man, we're not under that anymore, and we can kind of do what we want to do. Uh, and Paul blasts that out of the water as well in, in scriptures where he writes in Galatians 5.13, for you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Well, there's kind of the, the grace, and oh, okay, great. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. He says, yes, we've been called, we've been set free. Set free from living according to God's rules? Paul says, no, you've been, you've been set free from the bondage of sin. You're at liberty, you're at liberty now to follow and serve God in a newness of, of spirit that you never had before because grace is allowing you to do so. And so there's those two swings that are sometimes permeate our thoughts when we think of grace, and I want us to kind of walk away from both of those. And I want us to understand this morning as Paul explains grace and deals with grace in our lives, and um, it's important we understand the powerful grace in the proper biblical context. And so Paul is going to go right to grace, and I want to read again. We're going to just read verses 11 through 14. And then we'll pray this morning. Let's just read that together. It says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. And notice this, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave Himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. Let's pray together. Father, I pray that you would guide our time this morning, that we would understand the biblical teaching of grace. We'd understand that why, why you came to save us was unto good works, that you did save us by your grace. We are... We are freed and released from the penalty and the, and the condemnation, the judgment of sin, but that we don't have to serve sin any longer. And grace drives us in sanctification. And so God, this morning I pray that you would encourage us, your people, through your word, 
that we'd understand what we've been released from and released unto. That there's help as we struggle with sin, as we still wrestle with this flesh that's real in our lives. And so, God, I pray that you would guide this time together. You'd guide my words and my tongue. You'd guide our hearts and our spirits to be in tune with this. And, Lord, we'd walk away from your encouraged this morning and a deeper desire for you. And so we pray your hand upon this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, Paul is going to kind of break this into some different ways to observe and look at grace. And he looks at it kind of from two vantage points. As we're going to kind of set our, our frame of reference to, of our points here this morning. He's going to look at, yes, grace's impact on our past. Uh, appearance of Jesus Christ as He purchased our redemption. But He's also going to look at, at our future coming of Christ and glory that's going to motivate our lives in the present. It's teaching us. It's, it's motivating us. So we're kind of seeing the, the past, the present, the future in that. And I, and, I, and I emphasize this often as well when we come to the Lord's table. That we look at the different aspects of... It, we, we come to the Lord's table in remembrance of Him until he comes. So there's, there's the element of as we come, he wants us to remember what he did for us as grace was imparted to our lives and we have been forgiven by his shed blood and his broken body that we're remembering. That's what it cost to grant us grace as we by faith receive that Jesus died for us on the cross. But we do that until he comes looking forward to that future day when, when we will see Him again face to face and that motivates us in the present. That's why Jesus set up that as a, as a, as a thing that we would do um, uh, over and over again in our Christian lives as a church. As an ordinance that we would remember that and, and look forward to that. And so we're going to kind of look at it as well from those, kind of those magnetic poles that kind of drive us and keep us in this pathway of God's powerful grace. And so, let's look at, first of all then, God's grace, uh, grace's past appearing is available to all men. We'll see that in verse 11, and then he's going to kind of swing back into verse 14 and tie it. So we're going to look at both of those verses together here. But I want you to notice, first of all with this, his revelation to all. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Now you'll notice here in verse 11 that he uses the word appeared. He's going to use it again down in verse 13, the glorious appearing. And the word there is epiphany, uh, that, that, that visible appearing as it relates to God's grace. And so the question is, well, how has God's grace appeared to us? How has it been made visible to us? And I would contest that it's been made visible through the person of Jesus Christ, who is the embodiment of God's grace and deliverer of God's grace. That's why Simon in the temple, when he waits and Jesus comes and he's just a baby and, and Simon in the temple picks him up in his arms and he says, he says, as he looks at Jesus in his arms, he says, for mine eyes have seen your salvation. Grace has come. Salvation has come. Or John, as he introduces to us Jesus Christ in John 1, and in verse 14, he says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of what? Grace and truth. Jesus Christ is the fullness of grace. And then he says that in verse 17 of that same chapter, For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth was given, has come through Jesus Christ. And so Paul is building again on verses 1 through 10 in this chapter that we're in in Titus 2 and given a powerful motivation as he was calling out the believers in Crete on the island of Crete he's calling them out he says hey Titus make sure you encourage them that they adorn the gospel they live out this truth in their lives and he gave out specifics for older men younger men older women younger women how they're supposed to live this out in their lives and he says the key to this the place that starts is grace and the grace of Christ appearing. Now, <clears throat> notice that Christ coming to earth to be the Savior was not just for some elect group. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. In the context, 
Paul has again just spoken about all those different demographics. What's interesting is he includes in there even lowly servants. That was the, the previous words there in verses 9 and 10. Exhort bond servants. Slaves would be the idea there. And so the context is God's grace has been extended, has been made available and visible to all people. Doesn't matter if you're a slave, doesn't matter if you are an elder person, a younger person, doesn't matter where your context is, God's grace is available to you. Well, that's, that's comforting. That is a great news. This wasn't just for a few select people. Otherwise, I'd be worrying my whole life, well, was it really meant for me? But he says, no, this is for all. Now, I want to add some things, what that implies. What is that this, is, that this has been applied to all people, has been made, manifested to all people. What does that imply? Well, so let me give you some things that it does apply and then it doesn't imply. First of all, it implies that grace is needed by all people. It wouldn't be necessary for Him to have appeared to all men if we didn't all need it. The reality is, is all people are in need of grace. We all have a need because we are all sinners. Before you can appreciate grace, you need to understand that you are first under wrath and first under the law. And by the law shall no flesh be justified. You can't fix your sin problem by your merits. That's where the merit system falls flat. By the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified, the Bible says. And we are all sinners. There is none righteous, no, not one. We all have an incredible need. That's why we needed grace. So to use Spurgeon's phrase, he says, you know that the rope is around your neck. Grace then becomes good news when we realize the rope is around our neck and we are being hung by our sins. We are guilty, but grace comes and cuts the rope and says, you've been set free. And it's made available to all men. And so really from the extent, the Bible says, from our birth, we are born sinners because sin and death has passed upon all men for that all have sinned, Romans 5. And so we all stand at the gallows, so to speak, hung by our sin. But grace comes and says, I, Jesus comes and says, I came to offer you grace. I am full of grace, full of truth. And whoever will receive it can be set free. If you'll accept my pardon, if you'll accept my payment on the cross, I will come and I'll cut you down and you're free to go. So it implies to us that we all have a need, but it also implies that in one way or another, all men could or should have been aware of the power of God in creation, as Romans 1, 20 emphasizes, and the grace of God in salvation. So they are without excuse. How can the Bible say that we are all without excuse when we come before God? Because the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. He's put it upon their conscience. He has made it evident through creation there is a God who we are accountable to and we have broken it. It's not hard to explain or, or to get often people that are, especially young kids, to understand that we are sinners. Because it's a natural concept. We understand a, a holy God completely separate from sin and His standard is holiness. We'd say, well, then I, I'm sunk. And God has put that in every heart, the Bible says in Romans 1, so that we are without excuse. And if they fail to seek Him, He is the true light which lights every man that comes into the world, John 1, 9. This is the light which has come to light every man. And so it implies as well that everyone has at least a knowledge of God and has been an availability and understanding to some degree of grace. But sometimes men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. John 3, 19. Now, what does this not imply? What does not imply that grace will be received by all people? This is not universalism. This is not implying that all people are universally, no matter what, saved, and when he just, it's just like a blanket, poof, grace is on all. No, it must be received by faith. And so this does not imply that all people are saved. 
And certainly God desires all men to be saved. 1 Timothy 2.4 says that. He's not willing that any should perish. 2 Peter 3.9 But there are those like Jesus called out in John 5.40 who are not willing to come to me that you may have life. What an interesting word, he says. He doesn't say they are not able, but they are not willing. So apparently, the non-elect have free will. How does that play into the elect? At least the Bible does declare to us that the non-elect do have free will. So some will choose not to be saved. They're not willing to come to Jesus Christ, but he says, I have appeared to all men. My grace has been made manifest to all so that whosoever will may come. Whosoever will may come. Well, Paul is going to expound how that grace of salvation affects our lives today. And then he's going to come back then to verse 14 and kind of expound a bit further on what Christ has done and who he is. And so I want you to go jump down to verse 14 now. And I want you to notice his redemption from lawlessness. Who, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed. He's, he has his redemption from lawlessness. He gave himself for us. He might redeem us from every lawless deed. I've kind of had this song in my head, and I, I probably shouldn't say this, but I've had the song that was put out in the 80s punk band, Judas Priest, Breaking the Law, Breaking the Law. It's been in my head ever, like all week as I've been meditating on this text and this lawlessness that has been coming back to my mind, Breaking the Law. And that's really the idea that he says, all right, I'm, I'm redeeming you because you've been breaking the law. You've had this condemnation upon you. And, and that's what the word lawless is. It means against the law or rebellion against the law of God. And the reality is we have all broken the law of God and are already caught awaiting a final trial. But Jesus came to redeem us from that. See, we're not redeemed. We're not freed from the law of God, but unto the law of God. He frees us to be able to walk serving Him and freed from that condemnation of the law. And he says, he uses, he uses the word redeem. He's redeemed us. That would have gotten the attention of the readers pretty quick. Because remember, who is he writing to? Titus, who's speaking to who? Well, he just gave out the five demographics. What was the last one in verses 9 and 10? Bond servants, slaves. And we remember last week I mentioned that in Rome and in much of the modern world that day, historians agree that somewhere between a third and over one half of the entire Roman population was slaves. And this word redeem here, it was a word used of buying a slave out of the market so as to give him his freedom. He says Jesus came as you were bond in bondage and in slavery by sin, he came to buy you and say you're free. Over and over again, he is buying up. He's still doing it today. Buying and making free. You're on the, you're on the, you're on the block, so to speak, being sold. And Jesus comes and says, hey, I will buy whosoever will. Whoever will will let me take the punishment for their sins. I will buy, I will redeem them, and I will grant them their freedom. And it's a freedom unto new life. It's a freedom to now have a new Lord and Master to say, I'm going to follow Jesus Christ. He's granted me freedom from the slavery of having to serve sin. Being bound by that, as Romans 6 talks about. He's freed us from that. Why? Why did He grant that? So that we could just simply get a ticket to heaven? No to take us out of the bondage of sin, to set us to free to live righteous lives. That's why Paul said to the believers in Rome, he said in Romans 6, 11 to 14, reckon yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you, do, you should obey it in its lust. You don't, you don't have to just say, well, I just can't help it. I'm bound by sin. No, you're not. If you know Jesus Christ, your Savior, He set you free. He says, so don't let sin reign in your mortal body. You should obey it in its lusts. Do not pre present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God 
as being alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. Grace frees us from not being able to have victory. We are more than conquerors through Him who saved us. I love that word in the, in the, in the Greek, and I've shared this before. That's hooper nikao, super Nike. You are super Nike because grace is working in your lives through Jesus Christ. You don't have to be, you don't have to be defeated. You can be super victorious. And so he says, he's redeemed us from lawlessness, but then he says in verse 14b, the reason of pure, he wants a, the reason is he wants a pure, special people. Notice he goes on there, and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. He came to purify a special people, to redeem us from lawlessness, and to purify us that way. Now, the King James Version, has it says it this way, that he sought a peculiar people. Now, that may be very fitting in some situations, um, but the idea is a unique kind of people that the world sees and observes their lives, and they say, you're not from around here, are you? Something's different with your life. You have a different worldview than the rest of us. You're not living for this present world. Something's different in your life. And he says that's what he may call us to be, a special people, a peculiar people called out to live differently. And so it's okay to not fit in. Hebrews uses the idea of being citizens of another world. The great heroes of the faith have come out of the, have come out of the country of sin and we're looking forward to a better country whose builder and maker was God. They were pilgrims on this earth. And the reality is when we get that, we understand that grace has made us simply just a pilgrim here so that we can be a special people living for God, not living for worldliness, not living for all of the materialism or whatever this world can offer, the licentiousness, the, the, all of that, a different people. And notice he says, zealous for good works. It's, it's a word that Paul used to describe his fanatical zeal for Judaism prior to his conversion. He said, I was zealous. I was zealous for Judaism. It was a word that was used of the zealots who had opposed the Romans and actually had, had banded up and, and, and confronted the Romans back in Paul's day. They were the zealots. They were willing to risk their lives for the cause they believed in. This isn't some weak mamby pamsy type of thing that Christ is calling us to. Paul says, Christ calls us to be zealous, very on board with that, to not be lukewarm. We're, all, we're familiar with the, the martyr missionary, Jim Elliott, who gave his lives taking the gospel to the Aka Indians. And he once wrote this before that. He says, wherever you are, be all there. Live to the hilt every situation you believe to be the will of God. That's the idea, to be all there. We sometimes use the term today, all in. Man, I am all in on this. You know, I'm all for it. And so Paul is urging Timothy to, to man up, to make his Christianity a real thing, to get all in, um, to, to go for it. Some, some, some people that maybe is harder and easier than others in different areas of their life. I'm, I'm generally more of an all-in type of guy. That's maybe my personality. When I played sports, I, I played all-in. Um, one of the sports that I uh, loved playing growing up was lacrosse. And um, lacrosse is a, a physical, fast um, sport, and you've got to be going for it. And if you're on offense, you're going to attack. And you got to go after the goal and be running through there, and you're taking hits. And it's it's a harder game to play as the older you get. And I noted that when um, I, I joined a club uh, college team when I was about 27 years of age, and I played for three seasons um, up through 29 years of age playing for a college team. And we were playing Wright State and Akron State in different places uh, of colleges. Well, we would start practicing in the wintertime in the gym at this college that I was uh, playing for. And usually when you're playing the gym, you know, you're going to take a little bit easier. 
I, I don't know how to take it back a notch. I just knew how to play lacrosse one way. And, and I'd be running through and jumping across the crease and getting slammed by the defenders. And my coach would be like, dude, we are playing in the gym. Bring it back a notch. And I'm like, I, I can't. If you want me to attack the goal, I got to attack the goal. He's like, well, just don't get hurt in practice. All right. So later, in the, later, as we finally got outside to play the one season, I remember we were practicing. We had this big guy, um, Tim Belargen was his name. He was our biggest defender. Um, I don't know, he probably weighed over 300 pounds and just a big muscular guy. And um, the defenders play with like a, it's like a six foot pole. Well, I was doing my thing, running through, and I was coming through, and Tim went to jab me with his pole, and he got under my helmet, and he got me with his pole and, and hit my chin, and it split open and things. And so I went to the side, and I grabbed a rag, and my coach came over, and he said, man, you need stitches. You ought to go to the hospital. And I was like, you're nuts. And I just grabbed the chin strap, and I thought, I'll just chin strap that thing back up there. And I just <laughs> pinched it up and said, let's go play lacrosse. Afterwards, he came over to me and said, man, I appreciate you playing like that. He said, I wish I had more guys that weren't just happy to wear the jersey, that wanted to get out there and play all they got. That's the idea. Paul is saying, man, God is looking for us. He's redeemed us by his grace that we would be zealous for good works. That we'd say, man, let's get out there. Let's put it all on the field. We don't want to finish our lives someday and stand before God in our lives someday and say, Man, I wish I still got, I got stuff left in the tank. Man, don't, don't leave this world with stuff left in the tank. Leave it on the field. That's what Paul's saying. And grace, God has appeared to us, and he is calling us out to say, man, let's get a world view of what's really important, and let's live it for that. That's what it's about. And so Paul starts here with this idea of this grace is past appearing, it's available to all, and it is transformational in our lives. And then he's going to get into how that works. How does it transform us? Notice then, secondly, grace's present teaching encourages right living. So after you've received grace for salvation, and you look back at that, the question is, what's going to make us holy? Because the reality is, is we still struggle with sin, don't we? We still have a sinful flesh nature. We still have that struggle. Paul emphasizes that in his life. Near the end of his life in Romans 7, he's saying, man, I'm, I'm still wrestling with this stuff. Oh, wretched man that I am. Okay, so how, does, how do we get victory in this? Well, is it just willpower? Well, I'm just going to do it. Is it by guilt? No. Is it some inspiring message? No, it's a deep realization of the grace of God in Christ. That you are new. And as that new life comes in and continues to work over you, it presses out the old. The Puritans used to exa uh, give an example to try to emphasize this teaching by the idea of an oak tree. You ever see an oak tree that in the, in the fall it drops its leaves, but there'll be a couple leaves that will stay on there. They just, I mean, it's, it's blowing and stuff, but those leaves will stay on there. A couple just blowing throughout the whole winter until spring comes and the new life that's coming in actually pushes out those old ones. And the Puritans used to use that analogy to say that's what grace, as we desire God more and His grace continues to work in our lives to be more like Christ, it pushes out those old things that are still hanging on as those old sinful natures are still pressing on us he says, the way to do it isn't to attack the leaf, but to bring in new life. Grace working in us as we become more like him. And so the key is pursuing a closeness with God that produces new life. And Paul says here that grace, in verse 12 now, teaches us. The word teaches is a word that means child training. It implies with it, it implies with it chastening and correcting coaching and disciplining when we get saved grace doesn't simply stop there it coaches us it disciplines us it trains us as we desire to be more like christ 
So the idea is that you're not just a left to try hard, fail, try harder, fail, try harder, quit. Grace is on your side. Coaching, teaching, enabling you. So notice what it does. Grace coaches, oh, we already hit that first one. Grace coaches us to deny godless living. Notice what it says there. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts. There's a denial here. You have the Holy Spirit and God's Word and the church encourages you to walk away from that stuff. The word ungodliness, asebia in the Greek, refers to a person who does not reverence God and thus lives by ignoring God. They're in rebellion against God. It obviously refers to the person who is openly immoral or evil, but it also includes the outwardly nice person but who's living for themselves. The outward religious person who still has them as the central figure in their lives. It's a rebellion against God. It's a, not, a reverence for God. He's not put on the, the holy platform and the throne that He deserves in, in, in our lives. In addition, grace coaches us to deny worldly lusts. 1 John 2, 16 and 17, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. He says it helps us to understand that this world's stuff, the stuff that glitters, the stuff that says, oh, I need this new latest thing. I've got to have this, this new technology. I've got to have this new greatest thing, whatever comes out. And, and there's nothing wrong with having some of those things, but if that becomes what we are living for, if that becomes our, our drive and our greatest desires, then we are become a part of what Revelation deals with. We've been looking at in our Sunday night series, the Babylon. Babylon the Great. The system of economic and material abundance. That the Antichrist is going to come and bring to a, a level of highness during the during the tribulational period like we've never seen before. And so grace helps us to put on the blinder, so to speak, and to keep a, a frame of reference of what's really important. What's my worldview based upon? Is my worldview based upon who's going to bring me the most profit in my life? Well, then I'll vote for him. Or is, my, or is my worldview based upon, well, how can I put in the most hours so that I can get this new thing or I can get this new job achievement? Or is my worldview based upon, God, my life is about you and living for you. And I, I want to I live it all the way for you and have a different mindset than the world. To deny worldly lust, to deny ungodliness. So is God enough for you? That's the idea. To say, you know what, I might not have as much as some people, but I have got a close, vibrant relationship with a God who is the God of all gods. And I can have a deep, a deep, passionate love with Him. And I can know Him. I can walk with Him. I can, I can talk with Him in prayer daily. And in His presence is fullness of joy. That's where I can go after. Well, that changes my worldview. That changes what I'm going to go after. And he says, grace helps us to deny the other worldviews and go after that. Someone once said, life is tragic for the person who has plenty to live on, but nothing to live for. So grace coaches us to deny godless living, but grace also coaches us to desire then godly living. Man, I, I, want, I want that relationship with him. I, I want to know him and walk with him. It teaches us that we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. We've seen that word sober many times in the pastoral epistles. It means to be serious-minded about what really is important. Have you, ever, have you ever taken the time to put on paper what your top priorities in life are? To really be honest about it. I remember when I was candidating here. And, and one of the questions on the questionnaire was, put down your top five priorities in your life. That's a challenging thing to sit down and think through. Okay, I mean, and let me be honest about it, you know, and, and to think through, how, do, how, would I, how would I prove that? 
How would I prove that these are my top priorities? How would I prove that my relationship with God is my number one priority? Does my time with Him prove that? How do I prove that my family is my next number two priority? Does the way that I make decisions for them, the way that I lead them and guide them, does it prove that they're the next priority? Have you ever taken the time to, to really work through what those priorities are? He says it'll help us pursue godliness, that we live soberly, to think soberly. Uh, and, and the idea there is, as you think about these three words, soberly, righteously, and godly, grace will help us think right, that's soberly, do right, that's righteously, and pursue right, that's godly. Well, that sounds like a good recipe right there. That's a good, that's a good combination. But the question is, is that all future? Is this all, the, this grace will be applied, I'm looking to the future? No, he says that we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. It's, it's for now. Right now in your schools. Well, that's in a couple weeks, maybe. For those of you that are going back to school in a few weeks. To live it out then in your workplace, on your sports teams, to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. Now, I, something hit me as I was studying through this. <clears throat> There's a, a word that's throughout it uh, that Paul keeps using. He keeps using a plural form that he, he uses that teaching us that we should live soberly. Uh, he uses uh, the appearing of our great God and Savior who gave himself for us to redeem us. And I began to think, why the plural form here? And it hit me. You're not in it alone. This is not, this is not run out into battle all by yourself and hope you have victory. He's given us the church. Remember, this is the pastoral epistles. Paul's encouraging Titus, hey, strengthen the churches up together. Togetherness. Striving together for the gospel of Jesus Christ, Philippians says. There's a togetherness in this that, that we should live. And what I, what I looked at as I was studying some different things here is that we, the, uh, the word there, we should live, that phrase is a cohortative subjunctive. Now, what that means is it means mutual encouragement, cohort. If we think about that word cohort, it's a group of people banded together with a common interest. It's from the Latin cohorts, an, an ancient Roman military unit. There's a, there's a, we're, we're cohorts together in this. We're striving for God. We're striving in grace together in, in the church. You guys are my cohorts, and I am your cohort as a believer and a part of this church. We work together. We're one another's cohorts. Now, let me just give a plug then for some different areas where that makes that easier to be open in that. Um, and that's why I think involvement in a local church to be cohorts is more beneficial. Involvement that goes beyond just Sunday morning attendance. Involvement says, hey, I'm going to come out, I'm going to work side by side with some guys on a project so that we can talk while we work. Or I'm going to be involved in a Sunday school class where we can share prayer requests and, and I can be in a smaller group or pick a small group on Wednesday nights and say, man, I'm going to sign up for a small group because I need some cohorts in my life. I might be struggling with an area in my life and I need to say, can you pray for me? And I want to grow together because, man, I'm struggling in this area. We need cohorts. God did not place you into Christianity to be on your own. God's gift to you is the local church. To be involved in that. To plug in in that. To get involved with youth group. To get involved with Awanas. That's, those are great places to have that kind of togetherness. To go at it together. And Because I recognize... You know, on a Sunday morning, average Sunday morning, we're averaging, you know, several hundred people. Well, you're not going to easily be able to share your prayer requests the same. It, we need to have some smaller gatherings to say, hey, can I, can we grab lunch today? Or can we talk at small groups and share what's going on? 
So, so do you have those cohorts? Are you plugged in in that? Romans 10, 23 to 25 says, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promises is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. And so the idea there is we need to be a part of that local body. So we've seen grace's past appearing is available to all men. We've seen grace's present teaching is encourages right living. But then thirdly and lastly, grace's future looking grants blessed hope. Notice verse 13 there. Looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Paul now hits the, the forward gaze that motivates us. Remember I mentioned at the beginning, we're kind of in a, these, these, uh, the, the magnetic poles, so to speak, as we consider what Christ did for us in our past and uh, saving us on the, by His death on the cross. And as we look forward to His future coming, it motivates our present path. And so we kind of are, are kept between those, that polar field as we live in this. And he says, so, so keep that mindset of looking ahead. That's why we take communion and we are reminded until He comes. We're looking forward to that. <clears throat> now, notice what he says there, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is one of the greatest verses that declares the deity of Jesus Christ. Great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And people say, oh, that's two different people. Does the Bible ever depict God the Father's second coming or a coming? No. Jesus Christ. And the word language in the Greek there as well, as there is only <clears throat> one, um, um, oh, what's the word there? There's only one, I got it in my notes, there's only one article, the great God and Savior. That's not the great God and the great Savior. And so it's, it's telling us that Jesus Christ is not only our Savior, but He's also the great God. So when you have a Mormon or you have a, a Jehovah's Witness come and try to tell you that, or, or a lot of religions, honestly, that will try to tell you, well, that Jesus Christ was a good man, He's a good prophet, but He wasn't God. That's not what Paul thought. That's not what the Bible teaches. We are looking for the coming of our God, Jesus Christ. And the Bible nowhere else depicts the, the coming that we're looking forward to of God the Father, only of God the Son. And so that term t clearly tells us that. In addition, the adjective great is often applied to God in the Old Testament, but it's reserved for the Son in the New Testament alone. So this verse is a strong statement of Christ's deity. And we are looking for Him, which implies great eager anticipation. Like a young bride whose, whose, whose groom, whose husband went away to military and she is eagerly waiting for Him to come home. We are looking for His coming. And I can't wait till He comes home. Man, I can't wait till we are back face to face. And I want to live right for Him. I, I, it motivates me in my life to say, I'm going to be ready He could come home at any time. Maybe today. Maybe today. I can't wait. The story is told of a, of a, a tourist who was visiting <clears throat> this, uh, this mansion and, and this place that had these gardens and beautiful place. And, and he was, the, this man was touring. He was talking to the gardener and said, man, this is... This is meticulous. He said, oh, the, the, the master must be so proud. How often does he come through and stay here and, and see the gardens? He said, well, he's kept me in charge for the last 22 years. And he's been five times in those 22 years. The man asked, well, how long has it been since he was last year? He said, it was 12 years ago. He said, so why do you work like that? expecting that he'll be maybe, he might not be there for five years, another ten years. He said, yeah, but it could be today. It could be today. And I want to be ready. And that's what motivates the believer. Paul says, looking for that. Oh, we have an eager anticipation. Our Lord is coming. 
Our Lord is coming, and we look forward to that. So here's the takeaway from all of this. Paul is endeavoring to encourage us as we look at this text to, to whether we fall into the category of what he mentioned last week of elder man, elder woman, young woman, young man or servant, that we can live out these things to be a model of Christianity. We can have a close, vibrant walk with Christ to live out real Christianity. And he's encouraging us that grace of God that starts with justification at our salvation is a motivation, is an encouragement that carries us through in our Christian lives. Grace is very much alive and active in your lives today. And the more we understand that, as Paul teaches, that will aid us and encourage us as we desire to live for him, as we desire to walk with him. And so, grace, God giving us what we don't deserve, and he gives it to us daily. In the mid-1700s, <clears throat> Philip Doddridge penned the first stanzas of grace, tis a charming sound. I want to read part of the, just a few of the words, and I want to read one last stanza that was added later on by Augustus Toplady. But he wrote this, Grace tis a charming sound, harmonious to the ear. Heaven with the echo shall resound, and all the earth shall hear. Twas grace that wrote my name in life's eternal book. Twas grace that gave me to the Lamb, who all my sorrows took. Grace taught my wandering feet to tread the heavenly road, and new, suppli su and new supplies each hour I meet while pressing on to God. And then Top Lady added the fifth stanza, O let thy grace inspire my soul with strength divine. May all my powers to thee aspire and all my days be thine. That's grace. It's not just a past thing. It's a day-to-day -day living it. That all my strength, all my powers may be thine. My life may be thine. That's what Paul is emphasizing here. Grace is power in your life. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for our time together this morning. Lord, for the power of your grace. God, I do pray this morning, there is in this auditorium, either one of two people, every person here fits into one of two categories. God, there's some here this morning who you know because you know every heart who have never experienced grace. They maybe have been living their lives in a merit-based system, hoping they'd be good enough to be made right with you. And God, you want to extend, you have extended grace through Jesus Christ who is full of grace. No matter what area of their lives they're in, no matter how much sin they struggle with, that you're a God full of grace. And so, God, I pray today, would you speak to those hearts that they would say, today, God, I want that grace. I want my sins forgiven, and I am willing to receive it by faith. Oh, God, would you work in hearts that way? There's also another set of people here, God, that maybe they've had the grace applied at salvation, but they've never recognized or realized grace's continuing effort. As you've freed us from the gallows, you've allowed us to live unto godliness. Lord, help us to understand and allow grace to permeate every area of our lives. That our worldview, our focus would be different. God, thank you for your grace in our lives. It is truly unmerited. We don't deserve it. But God, you're good. And you're merciful and you're loving. And your mercy is new every morning. Your compassions fail not. And so God, we want to thank you for that. That as a holy God, you have allowed us, you've reached down into our realm and you pick us up and you set our feet upon a rock. That's grace. And so God, thank you for that. May we this morning, may we partake of grace anew that we'd apply that in our lives. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed.
<clears throat> I want to ask a question. I would assume that in a crowd this size this morning, there's some that may be struggling and say, man, I don't know if I've ever had that kind of grace to save me applied to my life. But I want, I want that. I want to be made right with God. I recognize I'm a sinner and I recognize God is holy and I believe Jesus died on the cross for my sins and I want to live for him. I want to receive his grace. If that's you, I don't want to call you out at my intention not to embarrass you. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed, but would you just raise your hand so I can pray for you? I'd like to pray for you. If you say, man, I, I want that grace applied to my life and I don't know if I ever have. I want salvation. I want grace. Would you raise your hand? Amen. Any others? Say, boy, I've never received that. Amen. You can put your hand down. I appreciate it. Hands can go down. I, I want to I say, if you raised your hand this morning, would you, would you just do me a favor? Heads are still down. Would you just look at me for a moment? I want to encourage you this morning. We're going to have a time of invitation. Would you come? I'll introduce you to somebody, a personal worker. We'll take you out and show you how you can receive Jesus Christ as your Savior to have that grace apply. It's your choice, or we can talk afterwards, but I would love to see you trust Jesus Christ, your Savior, and have that grace. Now, the rest in here, I have a second question. To the rest in here this morning, are you living by grace each day? Maybe you need to come and just say, God, I need, I want that grace to motivate my life, and I want to live for that. And would you come maybe this morning to say, God, this area of my life, I've been struggling, but I need your grace, your strength, that I can have victory. So just a moment, we're going to have an invitation. We don't do this often, but if you want to come and talk with somebody or pray or just come down and pray, I want to encourage you, why don't you come during this invitation? So let's stand to our feet this time. The instruments are going to play. Pastor Aaron's going to sing a song of invitation. But if you want to come, maybe talk with a personal worker, meet myself down here, or just come and pray on your own. This invitation time is for you.